I think it's time to get started as people filter in. Um, hello, everybody who's here with us today. My name is Natalie, and I'm the office manager for Tumble Home. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the session today, so I just have a couple of quick things to go over, and then we can get... Hi, guys! Hi! Thanks for joining us. Um, I would like to point out that uh, you guys are free to unmute during the presentation. We really encourage you to ask questions and participate. Uh, however, we do ask that, that if you have background noise or you need to have a conversation that's outside of the presentation that you do mute yourself. Um, just as a courtesy to everyone here, we have a lot of people yeah, joining yeah, yeah. Today. Uh, So we want to make sure that uh, there are no distractions and we can get through this and everybody have a great time. Um, also, please keep in mind that the chat is public today. So uh, feel free to utilize that. Ask any questions that you might have, comment on anything. Uh, please keep the chat uh, relevant to the presentation, though, just because this can get a little distracting to everybody who's here watching this wonderful presentation. Um, and lastly, I just want to let you know that we're going to ask a few poll questions throughout the presentation. Uh, the answers for these uh, will be completely an anonymous, so you don't have to worry about it. There are no wrong answers. Uh, we just want you to, to participate and have fun, and we really look forward to seeing your responses. So now that I've gotten the business side of things out of the way, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to talk about the puffins off the coast of Maine. Uh, we are thrilled to be joined by Steve Kress and Derek Jackson, whose book, The Puffin Plan, just came out last week on October 1st. Congratulations to both of you. It's an absolutely wonderful book. Um, it follows the progress of the puffin project and the efforts to restore seabirds to egg rock and beyond. Uh, you can see on your screen right now, there is a discount code to get the, the Puffin Plan for 25% off. I really want you to take advantage of it. It's a great deal. It's a fantastic book. I'm going to link to that in the chat so that you can grab it from here. But don't worry if you miss any of this information for any reason, I'm sending out an email tomorrow so that uh, you have everything that you need. Um, so on that note, I would like to introduce our wonderful presenters. We are joined by Steve Kress, who is a world-renowned ornithologist. He's the founder of Project Puffin and the retired vice president of bird conservation for the National Audubon Society. Uh, he's also a visiting fellow of the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And in case anyone here is unfamiliar with the word ornithology, it means the scientific study of birds, which you will be hearing a lot more about. Uh, soon. Uh, we are also joined by Derek Jackson, who is an award-winning former columnist for the Boston Globe. Uh, he's also an accomplished photographer. Uh, I can't wait for you to see some of his pictures in the presentation today. His column um, was actually a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and his UCS blog won a 2018 first prize from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. We've got two great presenters here today, and we have some excellent material to cover. I know I can't wait, and hopefully you're all just as excited as I am. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve now, and we can get things going. Take it away, Steve. Okay, thank you. Well, this is a pleasure to be on this show with everybody, and to I'll, I'll be starting out uh, talking about the history of Project Puffin, and then I will uh, pass the, um, the opportunity uh, forward to Derek, and then I'll come back at the end and we both take on questions. So um, I'm looking forward to, to sharing with you some of this, uh, my experiences with puffins. You know, it all started when I visited uh, the Hog Island Audubon camp in 1969, and then became the ornithology instructor there. And my, experiences there at, on Hog Island sort of started with telling people about the, the seabirds of the area. And what was interesting to me, looking back on those years, uh, 50 years ago, that then I was seeing the world as it was at that moment. And so often we tend to see what's happening now without the history. I've become very aware how important history is. Um, and one of the chapters of the history that was so important was the fact that people used to come to Maine to kill the birds to decorate ladies' hats. It was high fashion to make hats out of birds, whole birds. This black-headed gull is an example 
of a Steve, full bird mounted on a lady's Steve, head. just a quick uh, comment. Yeah. This is Barnett. Uh, if you could share your slides, that would be uh, that oh, would be I'm great. Sorry. I'm sorry. I thought that they were being shared. Uh, let me just. Uh, We don't want people to miss out on all the great pictures. No, no. <laughs> all right, I thought that was already happening. It wouldn't be Zoom if there wasn't a small technical difficulty. <laughs> I hope I don't have to leave and come back to do that. Um, but I might. But I'm not seeing how to do that. Um, you should okay, be able to. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Here we go. And I had a couple of earlier ones. I want to make sure everybody sees. Here we are. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Thank you for let, letting me know. Um, so I came to Hog Island in 1969 as a bird life instructor, and I was teaching people about birds as I saw them in 1969. But what I didn't know at the time was just how important the history was. So let's talk about the history of this. Uh, there were several pieces of the history which are important to explain what we see today. A big part of it was the bird hunting history, hunting birds for feathers for ladies' hats, for meat, for the eating, for eggs, for uh, selling in markets. Uh, that was important. Uh, and another part of the history was that every island was occupied by people, sometimes large communities on the most remote islands. This is Matinicus Rock, an island that is now famous as a bird nesting place in Maine. But in, but in the 1800s, it was a community of people that ate birds and hunted them. They ate so many that Maine was down to just one pair of puffins by that time. And so um, I learned a lot about the history and I began trying to think about what I was seeing at the moment. What I saw at the moment was mostly gulls, lots of gulls, beautiful gulls, raising chicks on bird nesting islands. Some of those islands had thousands of gulls nesting on them. And they were huge and impressive colonies. But these two were being affected by people. Gulls eat a lot of things, but they eat a lot of other birds. And all these gulls that were there in the late 60s, I learned later, was preventing birds from coming back. Birds like puffins and terns, especially. Another part of this history that I did not realize at the time was how many fish were being taken out of the water by the local people. There were dozens of sardine factories all along the main coast. Here's some pictures taken on nearby Matinicus Island of people capturing sardines, little herring, putting them in the boats. Uh, later they would be canned. Something I also didn't realize was that there were once vast numbers of herring that moved up the rivers. These river run herrings are sometimes called alewives or blueback herring. And they're very important to birds. The herring gulls originally were eating these herring. They weren't eating uh, garbage like they were, but the herrings were blocked from moving up the rivers by dams. In some rivers, like the Penobscot River, there's over 200 dams that block the natural movement. And so there was a lot less fish in the ocean. But what there was was a lot more garbage for those birds that could eat it, in landfills. But not every bird goes to a landfill. Puffins, for example, never go to a landfill, a garbage dump, but gulls did. So some birds were benefiting by people and able to adapt. Another thing I didn't realize was just the extent of commercial fishing was going on. It was taking even more food out of the water. Ironically, much of the fish taken out of the water was being turned into lobster bait. Most of it's used as lobster bait these days. And so herring gulls are getting herring, not from rivers or from the ocean, but by taking um, old bait off lobster boats. Another thing that was happening on the main coast 
was that there were other conservation projects helping rare and endangered birds like peregrines, and they were coming back. And bald eagles have now come back because conservation is working for these rare species, but nobody was helping to bring the puffins back. They were up against a lot of problems like mink and gulls and eagles and peregrines. All these forces were at play keeping puffins from naturally coming back to islands. So puffins needed help returning to main islands because, now this is the first of several questions that I'm gonna ask this group. I want okay, to we ready group. for the poll? And we're gonna put a poll up here. Yes, so click on the answers to this that you think work. And we'll give you about 30 seconds and see how this works. Read all these possibilities and see what you think. And then we'll end the poll in about 30 seconds. Oh boy, there's a lot of good readers, a lot of good thinkers. You were listening to me, I can tell. Okay, let's wrap it up right there. Okay. All right, so the correct answer is all of the above. And this is an important thing that I've come to realize over time. There's no simple answers to anything in nature. Nature is very complex. And so often the answer will be all of the above. In this case, definitely too many gulls. And there was few puffins nesting. And there were, um, you know, no adults left around to take care. So, yes, let's move on close those questions. So I came up with this plan. We call it the Puffin Plan in the book. The Puffin Plan was simply this. It was based on the fact that, that puffins used to breed on Eastern egg rock. And the question then became, should people let nature take its course? There were many people that thought to my plan to bring the puffins back to egg rock was not necessary because they would come back, it's on their own. That nature would eventually bring them back if they were meant to be there. And that's an important question in conservation. That's a, a way of thinking that sometimes people have to intervene. Not everybody agrees with that, but to bring puffins back, it seems like it was in fact necessary. So puffins, I had to learn about them. First of all, they're small seabirds. They look like penguins, but they're not even closely related to penguins. They're about 10 inches tall, that's all. They live in the ocean their whole life. They never come to the mainland. They start out life as a, as a tiny little puffin chick, this one just 10 days old. And they feed that single chick underground, male and female, mother and father, feed that little chick underground until it's about six weeks old, it heads to sea, and it usually comes back to the place where it hatched. But without any puffins breeding on egg rock for over 100 years, there was no memory of puffins breeding there anymore. I wanted to bring the uh, puffins back by instilling memory into them. So my plan was simply this. Find a place where there's still lots of puffins, fly there, collect puffins in special cases, little chicks, and fly them from Newfoundland back to Maine. It's about a thousand miles from the coast of Newfoundland to the coast of Maine. And I needed a special little plane to do that. And on Eastern Egg Rock, I had built several kinds of burrows. The one that worked the best was an underground sod burrow like this. I took the puffins out of their case, I gave them a handful of food and I planted them underground. So sort of like planting a seed, hoping it would grow. Now, to make this work, to be the foster parents for these baby puffins, to feed them for the next um, five to six weeks, we had to have people living on the island. And they were the puffin parents. We thawed fish. We put them in and the chicks grew up fast inside of their burrows. A month later, the little downy fuzzy pufflings, we called them, had grown up into puffin fledglings. And at night, 
wearing the leg bands that we put on them, they walked to the edge of the sea and they jumped in the ocean and they swam off. The problem was we didn't see any come back. For four years, we waited without seeing any puffins come back. Now the question was, what could we do? There were people saying this whole experiment is a failure. Four years of doing this, nothing had come back. But I said, give it a chance because this is new. Nobody's tried this before with any kind of seabird. So we put up decoys and lo and behold, almost immediately, puffins started landing with the decoys. And the exciting thing was that there was leg bands on their legs. And those bands proved that these were, these first puffins coming back with the decoys were in fact the little puffin chicks that we brought from Canada, from Newfoundland and Canada. Well, they quickly learned the decoys weren't real and flew away. So we came up with another idea, the mirror box. This reflective box with mirrors on all sides held their attention much better than the decoys. Four more years passed though, until finally we saw on the 4th of July in 1981, a puffin come flying back in with fish in its beak, a puffin with fish. This meant that there was a chick underground. The first time that puffins had nested on egg rock in about a hundred years. And they wouldn't have nested there unless we'd gone through this whole puffin plan. Well, what's happened since then? Remember, it took eight years from 1973 to 1981 to get the first five pairs. And then from then on, the population grew first slowly for about 15 years, just about 15 pairs. And then in more recent years, the numbers have been increasing. Increasing until most recently about uh, 188 pairs. There's probably about 500 breeding uh, birds there uh, in total. We also ex duplicated the experiment on another island, Seal Island. We brought a thousand puffin chicks to Eastern Neg Rock and an additional thousand puffin chicks to Seal Island to demonstrate that it was possible to replicate this. And science replication is very important. If you can do something once, that's great, but to be able to do it a second time and have it turn out the same way, and it took another eight years to get a puffin colony here, but the colony on Seal Island, another historic nesting site where people had hunted the bird for food and for feathers and their meat, um, came back even stronger. We have, there's over 500 pairs now nesting on Seal Island. In total, about 1,300 pairs nesting on five main islands. But well, we've learned a lot about puffins over time. We've learned a lot of this from sitting inside of bird blinds. And this is where I'm going to pass the, uh, the presentation now to Derek, who has spent a lot of time on bird islands with me in observations to take some of, some of his best pictures. So Derek, would you like to tell um, our audience what you've seen from a bird blind? Sure. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for taking that picture of me, which I never knew you took. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me make sure um, you need to stop sharing and so I can go. Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Can everybody see the uh, slide? Yeah. All right. Um, this, uh, I'm going to uh, call this basketball to birds because literally when Steve was um, starting his project, he started officially in 1973. In the early 1970s, I was um, just an uh, ordinary urban kid in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I was a sports writer and a sports photographer for my local African-American weekly newspaper and then became a sports writer at, uh, while I was in college at the Milwaukee Journal. Now, young people out there, how cool do you think it would be to be a teenager and have a floor pass for, uh, depending on what city you're in, for uh, your National Basketball Association team or your National Football League team to have a, have a field pass at Gillette Stadium uh, or to have a, 
uh, a, um, a photo box pass for the Boston Red Sox or the New York Yankees. Sorry, Boston people. Uh, I'm from Milwaukee, so it doesn't matter to me. Uh, but how cool do you think that would be, young people, to have that opportunity and if to be 15, 16, 17 years old and have a pass to do, to take pictures of, in this case, a photo from the NBA Finals um, in 1974 between the Milwaukee Bucks and the Boston Celtics. I'm from Milwaukee, so the wrong team won that year. Um, and I later uh, uh, was able to take some pictures of Larry Bird and um, even in uh, until recent years, I still did NFL photography. And of course, uh, those of you who know or care about football, um, this is Aaron Rodgers of the Packers. And I've gotten to take my pictures of uh, the you know, when Packers score touchdowns at home, we do the Lambo leap. Um, also was able to uh, take pictures of some of the greatest athletes of our time. Of uh, uh, This is Hank Aaron. Uh, I consider him the real home run king before steroids. Um, I, this is Aretha Franklin. I was, did a lot of photography entertainers when I was in college and high school. This is Marvin Gaye, uh, the Jackson Five. And I also, because of journalism, been able to meet some of the most amazing people in, 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 our, in our lifetimes. And this is Nelson Mandela receiving his honorary degree at Harvard University. Also, I've been uh, on the presidential campaign trail, been able to take pictures of, um, I think you can figure out who this is. Um, and uh, nice, nice limousine, huh? And was able to take photos of him during both of his campaigns um, for president. And if you're lucky enough, you even get your picture taken with the president. Now, that could be, if that was all I was interested in, that's a pretty cool career, right? Well, somewhere along the way, I met my future wife, who was a real outdoors woman, and got me into the outdoors in the early 20s. Before that, I actually thought that Cardinals was a baseball team in St. Louis. I thought Eagles were a football team in Philadelphia, and I thought Falcons was a football team in Atlanta. Um, uh, and that really was the extent of my knowledge of birds. But I became an environmental writer, um, and uh, I've been able to go to Europe, to England, to Denmark, to Germany, to take pictures of the offshore wind industry as it has exploded over there, and which I hope finally you know comes to the United States. You see, did you see how big those things are? Look at the people at the bottom. That's how big offshore wind uh, wind turbine parts are. And hopefully this is the future that actually will help save the birds because we're using far less to, and hopefully at the eventually no fossil fuels. But getting into nature made me get to look at the small things of life, like dragonflies, take note of all the things that happen in nature. This is an otter. I mean, I've been able to take some big picture, big animal pictures, an elk in uh, Colorado, a baby buffalo calf just born in Colorado, a butterfly. Um, this is indeed a great white shark in South Africa, which I did a snorkel dive with uh, in a cage. Um, and it's pretty cool to see them. Hippopotamus in Uganda, moose, seals. I also love flowers as well and landscapes. This is Yosemite Valley, Yosemite National Park, Death Valley, and this is Zion National Park. That's my wife at the bottom being a model. Um, uh, and this is a spot you have to wade in water for two miles to get to, um, to uh, see these beautiful narrow canyons. So I've learned that the world is really, really beautiful. There's a, a, a world so much greater uh, than what I grew up with in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I also learned through photography that, you know, keep your eyes open because you, nothing is ever the same twice. And two examples of that are Half Dome in Yosemite National Park, where, um, sorry about that, 
where one year I went and saw this, this wonderful sight of the, of the mountains emerging in the clouds. And then years later, I went to the exact same site right after a snowstorm. And that's what I saw, the last light of uh, the afternoon hitting the mountains. And in, and in your own backyard, my backyard is Boston. I have a bridge that I periodically take pictures of. One day I saw this, and then another day I saw that. But then there's the birds. The birds are my favorite thing of, of nature, and I've been able to do lots of uh, fun bird photography. I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, great blue heron, bald eagles. I love in uh, New England lakes where I see loons with babies. This, by the way, is the oldest loon in uh, uh, North America at the time I took this, uh, not in, in the Northeast when I took this picture. This loon was uh, estimated to be about 30 some odd years old and still raising two chicks. Sandhill crane, an owl, pelicans, a purple gallinule in Everglades National Park, a crow um, in the Swiss Alps. What's really cool is if we have uh, cities that really care about nature, you can have nature right in your city. Uh, this, are, this is uh, duck, uh, <laughs> uh, mute, mute swans in the heart of downtown Copenhagen. Hello. And they were nesting right on a right aside a bike trail. Snow geese, peacock, those of you who like zoos, you can get great pictures in zoos. This was in the San Diego Zoo. I've been able to take pictures of endangered species. Uh, the, this is the crested crane in Uganda, the African penguin in South Africa uh, in, near Cape Town. And also I've seen some of the wonderful stuff that can happen when we do take care of our environment. This is uh, a duck family in the Charles River. The Charles River had been one of the most polluted rivers in the world. Um, and is now uh, it's won international awards for, for its cleanliness. And these beautiful sites now you can see on the Charles River, a gull uh, feasting on herring, which are now, their run has been restored uh, up the Charles River because it's so clean. Uh, this is a night crown herring, uh, not knocking off a herring. Two of them, and there's another one. And my favorite one, of course, which brings me to this presentation and the, the book work that I've done with Steve is the puffin. Uh, there, I met Steve in 1986 um, I, when I was a uh, regional uh, reporter for Newsday in New York. And I read about this crazy nutty guy who uh, had restored um, this bird to an island in Maine. And um, I, you know, I went and interviewed him and I said, well, that's a pretty good story of how he brought the birds back. And you've heard a part of that story. And, and then it hit me over time, what a wonderful example of how we can save a piece of this planet um, is. And so um, I stayed in touch with Steve and uh, went back year after year. I started a series of articles for the Boston Globe periodically about the state of the birds, the state of uh, the puffins as he was approaching 100 pairs of puffins on Eastern Egg Rock. And just became uh, enthralled with the fa some really cool facts, like they, they after that uh, they hatch and go out to sea, they go out to sea for two to three years never to touch land until they come back to breed. And they also um, have uh, a couple um, other things that just uh, are really pretty unique to me. Uh, they're th the best parenting bird you could imagine. They just lay the food down in front of the chick pretty much. And they, uh, and the chick has to decide to eat on its own. So the parents, you know, we don't have to put a bib on the chick. And then when they go out to sea, uh, when they fledge, um, this is a, uh, in closing, this is a cover shot of mine that was in Down East Magazine. Uh, probably one of those miraculous things I've learned about the birds is when the, fled the, uh, the chicks are ready to go out to sea for their first winter, uh, they go out on their own. The parents don't leave them. 
the parents stay back. They hang out on the rocks. They're having margaritas, and the kids are out of their on their own. And so, um, this is a bird that reminds me uh, that the bird world is a lot smarter than we think it is, and we're not as smart as we think we are as human beings because we can't even begin to do the things these birds do from year one. And it takes us 21, 22, 30 years to figure out what these birds figure out in one year. So, Steve, back to you. Thank you, Derek. That was yeah. um, inspiring. I love your photos. They're really, they're always, always so amazing. Okay. Okay, let's uh, continue on where um, <clears throat> we are with a few more. Uh, here's a survey question based on uh, Derek's talk. You know, sitting in a puffin blind makes me feel. How does it make you feel? Think about it. If you've never been in a puffin blind, just imagine yourself uh, being there among the birds. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, nobody felt lonely or restless. Not at all. Time flies by when you're in a puffin blind. And you know, that puffin love means different things to different people. But to me, it means, wow, I am just oh, honored to be among them and grateful for that opportunity as well. Because, you know, if we hadn't done the right thing, um, hadn't moved forward with a puffin plan, there wouldn't be any puffins in front of us. And it's not just our own puffin blind, it's our own backyard. You can do these same kinds of things. You can bring birds back. We'll talk more about that, but I think it's something to keep in mind. This story could be your story. Let's talk about um, the puffins a little more here and what some of the things that we're, we're learning um, about how to keep the puffins there after, after they got there. So I tried, and I've done this over my whole career, is trying to think as best I can about um, how the birds fit into their world and how they've come to adapt to live there. And, and one of the ideas I had about what kept these puffin colonies going before people got in there and, and uh, hunted them and made so many changes was that they have this really great relationship with terns. Terns are related to gulls, but they are surface nesting birds that specialize on little fish, <laughs> like this Arctic tern is doing here, feeding its little chicks on the surface. And because they nest on the surface, they're very protective of their chicks. Uh, and while a puffin will fly away, hoping the predator would just leave, the terns will actually chase them. In fact, if a gull gets near a puffin colony or a tern colony, the terns will come right after it and they can fly faster with their sharp beaks, they can pick at the gull, make him chase, fly away. Even the bald eagle, um, the terns are not afraid to chase away a bald eagle because they can outfly them. After all, they fly to as far as Antarctica in the winter, so chasing a big eagle is no problem for them. I thought maybe that would uh, was how the puffins lived uh, among other predators. They had these terns as their friends. So I went out about trying to create a tern colony using decoys, which worked for puffins. And I added sound recordings because tern colonies are always very noisy. A quiet tern colony generally means the birds are scared away. But turn, a happy tern colony is noisy. And I discovered that um, the terns would often land and even offer food to the decoys. Uh, they would sometimes try and chase the decoys away with their wings out. Even stylized decoys um, that, you know, don't look exactly like a turn does. It looked enough like a turn to this turn to make it try and chase away this decoy, which I understand looks sort of like a Minecraft kind of a bird. Um, very just the essence of a turn was enough to get them to chase it away. And eventually, though, they would nest right next to these, these decoys. They would attract them, and then they could nest. This turn is laying eggs next to a decoy. So another thing that I've learned about birds, in part inspired by turns in their long migration, 
is that the methods that we developed for attracting puffins and terns back actually have very broad applications. I said that to the critics initially. I said, if we can bring back puffins, then we can bring back other rare and endangered seabirds. I was hoping maybe a few, but it's been amazing how many other people, how many bird heroes around the world have taken on this idea to bring back seabirds. This is a map from a current a project that I'm working on now to try to, to, to map all the locations around the world where people are using decoys and where they're using uh, sound recordings and moving baby uh, birds, translocation of chicks to, new, to, to bring seabirds back to some of their historic nesting places. And as this uh, graph shows here, over 47 species in at least 14 countries now are benefiting from these methods that we developed first at Eastern Egg Rock. I had no idea that these techniques would, would travel so far. They help them uh, succeed on these other projects. In Maine, we have a little decoy making factory now where we actually make rugged seabird decoys for conservation. Decoys uh, were used by hunters to lure birds to shooting, but never before were they used for conservation. And likewise, the mirrors, we're also helping other biologists with our, by exporting mirrors around the world. I want to just show you one of those projects. Uh, this is an island in Japan, uh, Torashima Island, also called Bird Island, where uh, short-tailed albatrosses uh, nested once in vast numbers, millions of them nested on this island, which as you can see is a volcano, an active volcano in fact. But people hunted them for feathers. This business of killing birds for meat and for feathers was not unique to North America. Around the world, people used birds and killed most of these short-tailed albatrosses. It was a tragic, tragic loss that so many of these birds died. But happily, bird heroes, in this case, uh, Japanese biologist Hiroshi Hasegawa and his, one of his helpers are using our de decoy method, our social attraction method, to attract albatrosses to a safer uh, place on the volcano. And here they've actually picked up these big fuzzy chicks in a helicopter and flown them to a non-volcanic island. And they put decoys around them, uh, hoping these birds will come back uh, to nest. And in fact, they have to hand feed them there, uh, two people to feed a fish into one of these big fuzzy chicks. But this amazing project is working. Happily, it was inspired by our project in Maine. Now, here's something else that I didn't realize would happen, but the puffins in Maine have turned out to be excellent indicators about climate changes and changes in fisheries. We're learning about this from those little boxes, those bird blinds that Derek talked about. By sitting in the blinds, we can see very close views of the puffins. And some of the photographs that Derek has taken and my research assistants have taken over time are showing us changes in these kinds of foods. Here's a puffin with big chunky herring in his beak. That's about the best meal possible for a puffling. But those herring and white hake, which I call superfoods, are sensitive to changes in water temperature. And as the ocean is warming from climate change, these cold water fish tend to move deep, often too deep for the puffins to dive and capture them. Or they move further from the islands out to cold water in the open ocean, too far for puffins to fly to capture them. That is probably today's biggest problem. The birds are safe from hunting. We have protective laws, but they're not safe from climate change. Another effect of climate change, the warming of the oceans around the world, is that warm water fish, in this case, butterfish, are moving northward into the coast of Maine on very warm summers. And these are just too big for the little chicks to swallow. Now there's good news too. There's new food, haddock. Haddock is a fish that is increasing because of good fisheries laws, fisheries that keep fisher, fisher people from taking too many 
of the fish out of the water. That's good for the fisheries and it's good for seabirds. This is an amazing graph to me because it shows in, in orange the temperature of the ocean. And you can see how it went up from about six degrees up to almost 18 degrees in just a couple of weeks in what's called a heat wave. And then it dropped. And the blue line shows the number of feedings per day. And notice when the temperature is warmer, there's fewer feedings. That's because the fish have gone deep or further from the island. And the little puffin chick, in this case named Grace, that we followed very carefully, during that heat wave, Grace became very lightweight and weak. She didn't get enough food. She might have died, but the parents kept feeding her what they could. The water happened to cool off. The fish came back to the surface in time for little Grace to get plenty of food. And just three weeks later, she was fat and thriving. A very good example of how climate change affects individual birds. Puffins are amazing this way and how responsive and adaptive they can be. So here's a survey question for you. I'm wondering, as the water temperature warms, little fish move in what directions? Let's see how you do with this question. Wow, what a sharp group, look at that. Yes, absolutely, they moved down and further out to sea so that they could stay cold. Fish are very mobile. The puffins are limited on how far they can go. Well, let's continue. So here's, I'm gonna circle back to that question about sustainability. On this case, at Eastern Egg Rock now, in order to keep those puffins happily nesting on the island, people are part of the community. One thing I've come to realize is that an island is not an island at all. It looks like an island, it's surrounded by water. You'd think what happens there would stay there, but this island is connected to everything in the ocean, to the fish, to the temperature of the ocean, to the salinity of the ocean, and to what happens on the mainland with the predators that, that come from there and swim out. So how can people ever leave this kind of place? Well, we always have to have tents there and have researchers living on the island. For some kinds of wildlife, I think that is the case. Think of this, people are part of the problem, people are also part of the solution keeping these interns living on the islands, become people becoming more engaged in conservation, not just on islands, but in our backyards, our front yards, our schoolyards, everywhere. People are making a difference through science, through observing what is happening and right, doing the right thing in response to our observations. In this case, bringing back the terns, and keeping the big predators away. These young biologists who are helping me bring back the puffins and turns to egg rock are the hope for the future. They are the heroes of the future. They're making a difference. We're all capable of making a difference. Now here's some ways you can learn more about puffins. You can go come to Maine, go on a puffin watching tour. And there are several trips out of Booth Bay and New Harbor um, every week, all summer long. They start in early June, they run through early August. So we've got about two months to do it. And these tours don't bother the puffins, they just circle the island. Another way to learn about puffins, to be part of this, is to watch the puffins on the puffin cams at explore.org, our partners with the cams. There are even cameras underground, so you can watch little puffins like Grace and see what they're eating each summer. Or you can come to Hog Island Audubon Camp like I did to take part in these five-day programs for families, for teens, and for adults. This is a terrific way to 
to learn more about conservation. And if you're an educator, you can come to Hog Island and take our classes, especially set up for educators. Teachers from all over the country, from big cities, little cities, inner cities, from the rurals, people of all colors are coming to Hog Island and learning together because learning to be a steward of this planet is the most important thing that can happen today. Learning how to take care of the planet and the beautiful wildlife that we have if it's to survive into the future. You know, we're all part of the, the, the chain of life, the, the web of connectivity between ourselves. We're part of this, everything from the phytoplankton to the lobsters to the puffins to the little herrings, it's all connected. And if one part of that is affected, everything else in the web is affected. So everyone can help puffins. Our final survey, here it is. What are some answers to this one? It's not a tough enough question, Steve. <laughs> and it's not, a, yeah, what a brilliant group. I'm not surprised you got this. But you know what? It's not enough answers either. There's a much longer list of things you can do to help uh, puffins and help wildlife and help other people too, because these things are helping people as much as they are the wildlife around us. In the back of our, our new book, The Puffin Plan, we do have. Um, lots of other suggestions and places to go to learn about seabirds and wildlife. So that book uh, not just tells our story, but it can be telling your story as well. So I'm going to end this uh, poll. I'll take this off the screen. And I'm going to close my, my story here. I guess it's closed now. Uh, so I, I, this was a terrific opportunity and, and, Derek, thank you for sharing your perspective on this as well. And, and audience, uh, everyone out there, thank you for taking the time to be with us. We're here now to answer your questions. So looking forward to hearing what uh, is on your mind. Are there any young people out there who just want to have there, a there. question? There were actually a couple of questions that came in from the chat. And if Natalie unmutes, I think she could uh, maybe get to those questions where we could, Natalie, are you, uh, are you on? Okay. Well, I, I can uh, read the questions. I see them. You see them as well? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Steve, there's a really good question. Um, is it true that puffins feed their chicks before f feeding themselves? Uh, okay, the question is, do puffins feed their chicks before feeding themselves? You know, we don't know very much about what the adults, uh, how often they eat, uh, but, is, uh, but they, do, they do feed themselves when they are out catching fish. We don't see them eat near the islands, and then they take care of the chicks. But I think if the food got really, really scarce, they would take care of themselves. Uh, as well as the chick, because these are long-lived birds. The only way they can stay long-lived is to have a long, long view of surviving, and that means eating. There was another question uh, that says, how deep can puffins dive? So the record that I've ever heard of for puffins diving is 200 feet. And, but I think that's uh, exceptional. Uh, more often they're in the top 50 feet of the water. And I think that's important to keep in mind because if they could dive easily down to 200 feet, they could go down and get those little fish when the water got cool. But it takes a lot of energy to, to fly underwater like they do. So they could burn up more calories chasing fish 200 feet than they got from eating the fish. So I think it doesn't, it doesn't work well for a puffin to dive that deep. Other kinds of birds like like big penguins who have, are much heavier bodied can easily dive hundreds of feet. Uh, an emperor penguin, 400 feet or more. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Steve, to add to that is that it's really important to know um, 
that most main puffins seem to dive only about 50 or so feet because uh, as you asked in that question, uh, poll question, uh, you know, many species um, of fish uh, are there, that, that little difference, that difference of 10, 20, 30 feet can make a complete difference in what the puffins catch. And uh, with climate change, uh, that's become, you know, even more unpredictable. Um, for one quick example, some species of fish, the core, the core population of uh, many species of fish are moving northward at rates that defy um, normal geological time. So the lobster, um, which when I started at Newsday in New York, lobsters were thriving commercially off the coast of Long Island and Southern uh, Massachusetts and Southern New England, that commercial fishery is almost completely gone uh, because of climate change. And lobsters, there are actually now uh, predictions that lobsters as a species um, may go even out of the state of Maine over the decades, their core population. Yeah. Okay. So we got a few a few other questions if you want me to read them off to you. Uh, oh, please do. Okay, Steve and Derek, uh, not quite sure who wants to take this one, but it's, uh, it's uh, someone mentioned, it's curious that puffin parents will take care of a chick after it's been handled by a human, unlike yard birds. And it's got a couple of question marks there. So is that is that true? Is that okay? So how does that work? All right. So first of all, it's largely a myth that handling a yard bird, if you will, will cause the parents to abandon it. It's not a good idea, however, to handle uh, backyard birds because it generally they don't need our help. Um, these little backyard birds like robins that end up on the ground, that's natural for them to, to leave the nest a, a few days before they can fly. It's very dangerous. Every day is dangerous in a nest. So they leave. Um, people often find them, think they're abandoned. So just leave them where they are. Uh, doesn't, but birds don't generally abandon their chicks if they're touched. And that applies to uh, puffins as well. Okay, and we got another question that says, how long lived are they? Yeah, Derek, you wanna handle yeah, that one? Sure. Um, well, uh, during our course of writing our original book, Project Puffin in 2015, the oldest puffin in Steve's project was still alive, uh, a bird named Y33. Um, and uh, that bird was last seen at 35 years old. And at 35, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it was still raising chicks in its last two to three years of life, uh, a chick. And um, there was, uh, there are European puffins, uh, um, Scottish puffins um, that made it to, there was always a puffin while Y33 was alive that was two years older. And while we didn't want to wish any ill will on that Scottish puffin, um, we, so we're still kind of had hopes that uh, our puffin would become the oldest at some point. Um, the uh, I, I believe in Europe they have a recording of one that was 41. Um, um, so they're they're they they they're they're capable of living a long you know really long time. The interns on um, uh, when the one of the most things that consistently the interns tell me is how amazed they are that some of these birds are older than them. Wow. Okay, we've got a, another question that says, when you moved the chicks from Newfoundland to Maine, why didn't you take the parent puffins too? So we didn't bring the parent puffins from Newfoundland because the parents have a, a great ability to migrate home. And if, if we had done that, they probably would have flown right back to Newfoundland. It's the chicks that are still um, to learn where home is. So, and, and that wasn't really proven either. That was a guess. But um, we did figure that, you know, we take our chances with the chicks and that's the path we went. And I think it was, it was the right decision. 
And I think we have a we have a fan here. Uh, uh, someone named Melanie said, "My son and I took the puffin boat tour in Maine in 2015, and they were lucky to see Steve and Derek uh, presenting on the boat. They live in San Diego and just wanted to see them again. How fast do puffins fly? Fifty-five miles an hour is, wow. is the uh, general thought on that. Yeah, fast, isn't it, for such a uh, short-winged bird? Yeah." And their and the thing about the their wing beat is so um, uh, is unusual among many birds. It's it's one of the it's super rapid. It almost looks like a fat hummingbird coming in coming to the island. Uh, we have a couple more questions. One uh, says, uh, "Where do non mating puffins sleep at night?" Uh, well, I think that yeah, non mated puffins probably sleep out on the water. Although we don't know very much about that question, but some of them might sleep on land. Um, hard to know. That's an interesting question. Um, we do know that as birds get older, they spend more and more time on land. And some of them will have actually pair up at least a year before and they'll start staking out a territory. We call these prospectors. Um, they may even build a nest. So, but they don't breed till they're five or six years old for the first time. So they, they have time and opportunity to, to get to know land. Okay, we have a, another question. I'm not quite sure if there's a spelling error in this, but um, I, I, otherwise, I don't know how to pronounce it, but someone read somewhere that great skewers, I'm not sure what, what that is. Great skewers drown puffins. And have you ever seen something like that? Have you ever seen an event like that? So great skewers live in, in Europe. Um, and yes, they do uh, prey on puffins. So that, would, that was one less threat that we had to deal with when we were thinking about restoring. But if, if you, we were in Europe, yeah, great skewers, that's a big, that's a threat. Sure. Okay, and I I went through this. I'm not quite sure if there's uh, any questions that I missed further up in the chat. Uh, but if there's anything else uh, that that you want to ask, uh, please do so right away. Looks like there's still quite a lot of participants right now. Don't know. Can anybody hear me? Oh, can hear you now. Yep. Aha! Yay! Um, I was going to say. Feel free to unmute your mics and chime in with a with a question out loud. You don't have to type them in the chat if you don't want. You know, you were mentioning about these uh, skewers uh, killing puffins. I've been told, I've read that uh, in Iceland, puffins are considered a delicacy. Have you done anything about that as far as trying to preclude that from that uh, butchery from taking place? Uh, so, yes, uh, the puffins in Iceland are still eaten by people. Uh, there's a long, uh, a long history of puffins hunting there. Uh, they, they think of them as, as uh, probably as people did off the main coast, at least some people do. Uh, the puffins in southern Iceland are now protected from that. They don't hunt them in southern Iceland, in part because the uh, population is not replacing itself. Iceland, the puffins in Iceland are now part of the, they're part of the European population and puffins are now considered actually endangered in, um, in Europe. So for good reason, they've stopped hunting them in Southern Iceland. This continues, however, in Northern Iceland and sometimes they ship them uh, to Southern Iceland. Uh, they can't ship them outside of the country. I don't think it is the big, big, it's, it's a conspicuous problem, certainly for those individual birds, but for the puffins in general and the puffins in Iceland, I think it's still a relatively minor problem. Climate change is the big uh, factor there. It's kept puffins from breeding successfully for a decade in some of the largest Icelandic colonies, which is really, really a scary thing when you think about that uh, being the world center for puffins. Just a second, uh, what Steve is saying, um, I think it's important to note that, you know, puffins are really, uh, you know, a signal bird now for us. Um, 
a huge percentage of seabirds in general are in danger of some uh, major threat uh, because of either overfishing, climate change, local pollution, uh, and what have you. And so um, the Atlantic puffin actually on the international red list um, of, of a threatened and endangered species until about 2012 or so, the Atlantic puffin was considered a bird of quote, least concerned. And now because of the threats in Europe that Steve is talking about, um, it, the bird is now threatened. Um, so, uh, and if you wanna know how fast a bird can go from least concerned to critically endangered, um, I, I've had the opportunity to, as you saw in the, my show, uh, take pictures of the African penguin uh, that bird, there were hundreds of thousands of those birds, pairs of those birds in Namibia and South Africa. Um, and a century ago, there were two or three million of them. And today, they are because of the threats that uh, we've been talking about, that bird is now down to its last 25,000 pairs. Um, the population, in fact, has crashed 90% in the last uh, 30 years or so. So... Um, you know, one of those things, it's one of those things, it's like the passenger pigeon. Uh, we think they're, they're, they're they blacken the sky, but we shoot them just like who, who took out the last great auk. Um, they, whoever took it out thought there must have been more. And, you know, we got to be really careful be before somebody takes out the last of something. Thank you. Uh, we have just a couple more questions. I know we've kind of run over. So if you have a couple minutes, um, do puffins mate for life? So these questions about um, that tend to look for one answer. Um, I always kind of like have to remind myself, first of all, is that every bird is different and some birds do and some birds don't. But, but in general, uh, puffins, majority of them, keep the same mate year after year, and they return to the same burrow year after year. Those of you that have adopted puffins through our program will find that um, some, some of these puffins will have the same mate every year and others don't, and, and they may change. There are actually divorces in some puffin families. And we don't know why that happens either. Um, if you, you wanna follow something for your family or for your school classroom, and want to really learn about individual birds, I encourage you to, to do our Puffin adoption program through Project Puffin. That's a great way to engage kids with, uh, engage anybody with the real life of an individual bird. Absolutely. Uh, and I will be sending a link uh, tomorrow in tomorrow's email for more information about the Adopted Puff Puffin program, just so everybody is aware. Um, is there anything more that you could tell us about the adopt a puffin program? Well, adopt a puffin program. Um, it costs a hundred dollars to adopt a puffin for the year. These are real puffins, wild puffins that live at Eastern egg rock. They have a long history and you get a, you get several things when you adopt, you get a, a biography, a biography of your individual puffin with a photograph of your puffin that, um, was taken in that year. The back of the page has a, a history of the, of the individual puffin with uh, who its mate was and whether it produced a chick uh, for each year and how that changes over time. And you get a certificate uh, and you can name your puffin too, which is a fun part of this. Uh, and the certificate is uh, framed and you can frame it and uh, it's just a nice gift for people that, are, that may have everything else, but uh, <laughs> except for an adopted puffin. Absolutely. I have a follow-up question. Can you visit your adopted puffin? So you can visit the puffin by coming out on one of these tour boats and you can Perfect. see the uh, puffin habitat. We, we, we can't have people land on the island during the nesting season, however. That would be too disruptive uh, for the birds. But if you go on a puffin watching trip and you ask the narrator, who is an Audubon um, educator, uh, they can point out where the puffins live and maybe get you very close to seeing your puffin. 
That's awesome. Um, I just have two more questions and then we're going to sign off for the day. Uh, I know some people have some things to get to. Uh, is there satellite tracking done with the puffins and what kind of results do you get if there is satellite tracking? So puffins aren't large enough to carry satellite uh, transmitters. You have to be a little bit bigger than a puffin, but there are some tracking devices that can be put on puffins, especially attached to their leg bands or tiny ones now attached to their back. Um, and they, they can tell us where the puffins go, uh, both during the winter months um, and during the nesting season. So the geolocator type tells you the big picture, tells you the puffins from Maine, uh, usually go up to Canada um, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and then back south across the border to the edge of the continental shelf. They often visit a place called the Coral Canyons and Seamounts uh, National Monument. And then they come back to the nesting island in the spring. During the nesting season, they can fly 30 miles from the nesting islands in order to get a beak load of fish. And, and these are all things that we didn't know about even just a few years ago. So these miniaturized tracking devices are the new age for ornithology. And we're very excited that finally, some of these things are pro providing important answers for puffins. It, it's important we protect their net, not just their nesting islands, but the places where they feed and where they winter. Well, Absolutely. Just, to, just to briefly follow what Steve is saying, the, the <laughs> geolocators and the, the fact that um, one of the last acts of President Obama um, was, in fact, to declare the first and only still um, national monument, ocean, ocean mo monument in, in the Atlantic, which is the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts. And uh, with those uh, geolocators, uh, it turned out that the puffins ended up being sort of one of the you know reasons uh, to preserve that area uh, because uh, it, the fish life, the coral life, it's so rich. Whales, other birds are there. And, you know, without those geolocators, um, that, that, that's one species less that could have told us that uh, where there was still in a major healthy part of the ocean still left and giving us a lot of scientific evidence of what we can, um, you know, have if we preserve it. Absolutely. All right, one last question and then I'll let everybody go. Uh, do the puffins stay together when they're in the sea as well or just when they're on land? Uh, this, this is still a mystery, uh, but there is some recent research from England that shows that sometimes the puffins do stay together um, in the winter. So it's probably like they do they make for life. Uh, they don't all do it, but at least some of them do. And maybe, maybe many of them do, which is really exciting to, to learn that bit of new news. Yeah. Absolutely. The next stage of, of Puffin research. I look forward to it. <laughs> many unanswered questions. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, everyone who is still here. Thank you for all those wonderful questions. This was very insightful and really exciting. Um, also, a huge thank you to the Brockton area branch of the NAACP and the Brockton Public Library. Uh, stay tuned, we've got some more Tumblosity programs coming up soon that you can check out on our website. Bye everybody. All right, have a good night. Thank yeah. you, you too, yes, I love that shirt. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.